So if you like free shoes, if you like free check bags, if you like free food, can I offer you something else that's free? Salvation in the name of Jesus. If you just confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead, you will be saved. It's free. Forgiveness of sin, free. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, free. New life, free. Everlasting life, free. Abundant life, free. Somebody say, it's free. Somebody open up your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. 18 to 25. While y'all getting your smartphones, your Bibles ready, uh, I just want to make a quick little announcement. If anybody in the house tonight that is interested in joining the praise and worship team, come see me either tonight after Bible study or come see me Sunday. We're going to expand. We're going to call more people up on the team. We, wanna, we want you to use your gifts. If you God is calling you to the worship team, come check. Come, come see me. Come see me. Amen. All right. So y'all got it? If y'all got it, if y'all got your Bibles, if y'all ready, somebody say, I'm ready. All right. And we're going to read out of the New International Version tonight. The New International Version tonight, so we can skim through it a little quick. All right, here we go. The Bible says, verse 18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness. Somebody say through the foolishness. Of what was preached to save those who believe. The Jews demand signs. They want to see signs. And the Greeks look at look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Somebody say foolishness. But to those who God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness, God is wiser than, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human wisdom. Somebody give God some praise for his word. Amen. Amen. But I, I just want to read all of that so y'all can just see uh, uh, where I'm coming from. But the scripture that I really want to uh, come out of is the first one. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's the scripture I want to expound tonight. Amen. God, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for all what you're going to do tonight. We, we, we just open up right now, Lord God, for you to just come through, speak to us, do what you got to do tonight, Lord God. We just pray, Lord God, that you would truly show yourself mighty in this place through this word. And we say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if I had to put a title on this message tonight, the name of this message would be, That's Some Foolishness. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, That's Some Foolishness. That is some fool. That's Some Foolishness. You know, because, you know, the foolishness of God is wisdom, actually. So let me just kind of share with y'all. A lot of y'all, some of y'all don't know, you know, I grew up. Going to church, my mom brought us to church growing up. Uh, you know, we did the best we could do to go to church every Sunday, and uh, and so my mama used to take us. We was uh, she used to take us to church. We went to Queen of Peace, went to all kind of different churches. Huh? Went to Minor Temple. <laughs> we was just going to church back and forth. So I didn't see growing up. Now I was young. I didn't understand, you know, all the things coming up. But that's one thing. We used to cut up in church sometimes. We used to get popped in church. Still, still my mom, y'all better pay attention. So, you know, I'm watching the church. We used to enjoy the worship, enjoy the word, enjoy everything about church. And so uh, we growing up, you know, in church. I grew up in church, you know, uh, 
And that even as I graduated high school, uh, the Lord saved my soul coming to Philadelphia Christian Church. And uh, so I'm still in the church. <laughs> uh, and so uh, it's a different type of church. I was actually growing, got saved here and everything. And so uh, being here for 16 years uh, at church faithfully, consistently. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's just a great thing to be a part of a church. Now that I came here, I have a better understanding. Uh, I've learned so much just being in fellowship with y'all, being under the pastor, being under the teachers. Just uh, grew so much just being under the word of God. And I really just, I really love coming to church. You know, this is something that I really desire. I really love coming to church. Uh, and I, I believe coming to church has been a really big part of uh, making me into the man that I am today. Uh, uh, and for my family and my kids. And so coming to church is really has been amazing. Uh, I love the fellowship. I love worship. I love hearing the word. And, but uh, I've also learned that church is this problematic paradox as well <laughs> it's different challenges in the church it's different things that's in the church on, on one hand it's a place of healing where people get healed I didn't see people get delivered get healed right in my presence uh, souls get saved lives get redeemed families get restored children raised to know Jesus and love Jesus Christ I've seen that but on the other hand I've also seen Church can be a place of hurt, great hurt. We all cry. Come on, let's be. Anybody grew up in church? If you grew up in church, you know what I'm talking about. Church can be a place of, of great hurt, church hurt. Uh, and on the other hand, it's a place where the glory of God is made manifest every Sunday, every Tuesday, every week. The presence of God is here. And when you come into the house of God and lift up praises, the word is broken down. Souls are saved. Lives are being changed. The glory of God is, is inescapable. You ever been in the presence of God where God just moved in his house? But on the other hand, church can also be a hot mess. Like Renata used to say, a hot mess. Some, some kind of ugly kind of sort of. Church can be a place that edifies your spirit. And at the same time, work on your last good nerve. Y'all acting like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> like, come on, let me tell y'all something. The more you live with people, it don't matter if it's with your family. This is, I'm just speaking of church because we're going to see where I'm going. But it can be with family. Sometimes you being with family, sometimes they get on your last nerve. Like, you have times where things are good and times where things just, oh, you know what I'm saying? And so... That, that anything, you know, I've seen church at its best and I've seen church at its worst. Church have ups and downs. You know, we experience the presence of God, then we experience something, some other stuff. Church bring the best in people and can bring out the worst in people. Now, this is me talking to people. I talk, I'm fellowship, I, I love people. I listen to people's conversations. I listen to what people go through. That's just what I do. I just have that type of heart just to see what's going on, you know. And one thing that wrestled with me is how can the church get so messy? And I'm speaking as a, whole, a church as a whole as well, not just this one. Not, not this one, matter of fact. We, we a good church. We church of Philadelphia. That's the good church in Revelation. <laughs> how can the church that is created by Christ establish on his death and resurrection get so messy how can we worship lift our hands call on God also talk to people mean and nasty like, 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 like they just nothing come on how can church get like that well brother Carl that's the problem what Paul was dealing with right here in the book of Corinthians. That's the same thing they was dealing with. Corinth was one of Paul's greatest churches he ever planted. On one hand, this church grew quicker than any other church that he established. From few souls to a lot of souls. It's a church that, is, that was wealthy. 
It was a church that was filled with different gifts. People were operating in their gifts. It was a church that people were very generous. They were uh, they had all the the uh, appearance of uh, of a Christian. And and this was one of the greatest churches. It was wealthy. They had all of that. And if you name it, Corinthians had it. But at the same time, on the other hand, Corinthians was a hot mess. Members were suing each other in court. Uh, the rich was mistreating the poor. Uh, the church was filled with sexual immorality, in-laws sleeping with each other. Uh, they were bragging and boasting about the gifts of the spirit, but did not know how to love on one another. It was so much division in the church. So that was, that's, this actually is in this chapter division. Talks about how there was so much division in the church. There were people in the church arguing about who's the best leader. I, I follow this leader. They were following leaders based on their personality or what they like about them and not the person of Christ. Oh, we follow Apollos. I like the way Apollos teach. Who teaching for Bible study? Apollos or you come to Bible study based on who teaching? They picked on, you know, or who ministers so such and such teaching, or they, they choose this deacon, or, or they go to this, this minister that started their church, or they go to this deacon that started it. They, they, everybody is division in the church. It's so much division. You know, I love Apollos. I love Paul. I love Peter. I love deacon such and such. I love minister such and such. So they became groupies around their leader. They talked to their leader. Rather than operating in unity, they divided themselves in cliques and fashions about which one is their pastor or, or which pastor they like the most. Come on, man. Which one they would listen to and which one they would stay uh, at home for. This church was a hot mess, y'all. I'm telling y'all. It was a hot mess. So Paul writes to them a letter that's, that's meant to help pastor them. This is what Paul do. Paul helps pass it on. So he, he does a little diagnosis on the problem that, that comes to the conclusion that what messed up the church in Corinthians is that they had all this religion, but they didn't have no gospel. Ooh, they were so caught up on religion and duties and doing work and, and so caught up on the work of God, but forgot about the Lord of the work. They, 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 they lost their focus on the understanding of the gospel. They were so focused on religion. So focused on religion. And you have all the outward signs, all the trappings of church, but they didn't have no gospel. You've listened to preaching, but you live but your lives have not been grasped by the gospel of Jesus. Paul said, what a shame it is to have religion. What a shame it is to have teaching. What a shame it is to have all the singing, but don't understand the gospel. What's the point? There's a, there's a man by the name of Andre Resner. You can go look him up. He, uh, he go to Hood Theological Seminary. He said, one of the things that destroys our current churches is that We've got a, a whole lot of Bible and a whole little gospel. It is possible for you to be filled with scripture, but be void of gospel. You know that? You can be so filled with scriptures, but be void of gospel. You can use the Bible in a way that contra that's contrary to the gospel. You know that? Andre Wells, he, said, he says, until you understand what God was doing in Jesus on the cross to redeem you, to redeem humanity, you would always miss, you would always mess up religion. You would always mess up things. Because you have, you can have Bible, but have no gospel. You have your Bible, but no gospel. You can create a hierarchy of sin that makes what somebody else do worse than what you do when you got Bible but no gospel. When you have Bible but no gospel, you will deny people leadership in church because you can quote Paul, you can quote Moses, 
but you can't quote Jesus. I'm telling y'all, you can have a, a place filled with Bible, but if you don't understand the gospel, that's going to always be division. It's going to always be strife. It's going to always be some kind of trouble because you missed the understanding of what Christ did. Yeah, yeah, God wants us to be blessed. God wants us to be this and prosperous and all of that. We got Bible. But do we, did we ever lost focus on gospel? Let us not be the, a, 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 a people that misunderstand the gospel. Because when you got Bible but no gospel, when you got religion and no relationship, the church will always be a hot mess. Always be a hot mess. I'm telling you from experience. The gospel is so critical to the church. When Paul sees what's happening in Corinth, he says, listen, listen. I know what you need to do. I know what I need to do for y'all. I'm determined to declare nothing else among you other than Jesus and him crucified. That's what Paul said. This is what I need. This is what y'all need. Because y'all got all the other stuff right. But, but y'all need the gospel. Because of all the assignments... Out of all the assignments you have as a believer, as a leader, the number one priority is the gospel, to proclaim Christ crucified. That's the number one priority. No matter what other duties we have as a believer, our number one priority is to declare Christ crucified. That's our number one priority. So we look at it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. The Bible says that the gospel which is to those who receive it, Paul says, was foolish. The gospel to which those receive it, Paul says, was foolishness to those who were perishing. It was foolishness. They were like, what? Because you got to understand, <laughs> God's foolishness is wisdom. But those who was in philosophers and those who were so caught up on human wisdom, they, they, looked, at what, 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 they looked at the cross as, as foolishness. It was like, oh, that's some foolishness. We ain't listening to that. It don't even make sense. So they just did their own little thing. And so the Greek word for foolishness is moron. That's, what, that's the Greek word for foolishness. Moron, moronic. The message is moronic. This message ain't got, this message don't make sense. This is just, the preachers, preaching this of foolishness. This is the preaching of foolishness. They, they, was, they was like, come on, man, that's some foolishness. And God, through the foolishness of preaching, has saved the world. That's something, huh? And so let me, let me give you all some advice. So if somebody ever come up to you while you sharing the gospel, if somebody ever come up to you and tell you that's some foolishness, then at that moment, I want you to look at him and act a fool. <laughs> act a fool for Jesus. Tell him, look, I know he died on the cross for me. Act a fool. When, the, when church is starting to cause division, in the, act a fool. Tell him about the cross. Look at your neighbor and say, act the fool. When there's division and sin and people losing their mind, tell him, act the fool. Act the fool for Jesus, man. <laughs> Y'all cutting up. Listen, and why the gospel is foolishness. Let's get into my points. Here's why people don't receive it and why it doesn't change lives the way it should because of the, God, because of the gospel. Three po quick points and I'm going to let y'all go. Three points. Number one, the reason why people don't, the, why they think the gospel is foolishness is because the gospel is the message of the cross. Verse 18, it says the gospel is the message of the cross. The gospel goes like this. Let me break it down for some of y'all. God came in Jesus, found himself nailed to the cross, and through the death on the cross, our sins are paid for. And we are redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And we are renewed in our walk with God. And we are restored in relationship with one another. And it was like, man, that's foolishness. Here's the foolishness. I'm going to say it again. God came. 
God was nailed on a cross. And because he died for our sins and he paid for our sins, he redeemed us from the enemy and he renewed us with our walk with God. And we were restored in relationship with one another. And the Bible says that when the Greeks heard this, man, that's some foolishness. They were so focused on human wisdom. Paul says when the Jews heard this, when the Jews heard, the Greeks said this is foolishness. But when the Jews heard it, they said stumbling block. Stumbling block in Greek. The Greek word for stumbling block is scandaline. Somebody say scandaline. It also means trap stick. It also means obstacle. And what do you hear? Let me ask you a question. What do you hear when you hear the word scandalize? Scandalous? Some of y'all say it prints. <laughs> Scandalous talking about you and me. Some of y'all, some of y'all heard Olivia Pope. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's what I, when I hear the word scandalous. Because in their mind, how can an omnipresent, omnipotent God who created the heavens and the earth find himself on a cross? Now, the reason why it's not scandalous to us is because it's simple because we have nowadays when you think about it, the reason why it's not like that to us because we have spiritualized the cross. We have sanitized the cross as though it were. So we don't see it that way. We are accustomed to the cross. And it's like it's synonymous with Christianity. We see crosses everywhere. So, and it's different in those days. See, churches, you see them with, you see churches with, with, with crosses on the building. Like, we got one on the cross. We got one on the church. You see them on artwork. You see them on billboards. You see them tattooed on your neck. Some of y'all got it tattooed on your arm, the cross. Uh, you got the jury. You got the piece of the cross. Some of you even have them burning in front yards. They, they, they use the cross. The cross. But in Paul day, the cross was not a sign of Christianity. The cross was a symbol of Roman imperial power. It was a sign of execution. There was no hymns about the cross. No, nobody was singing at the cross at the cross when I first saw the light. Nobody was singing down at Calvary. <laughs> because that, they didn't uplift the cross. The cross wasn't like that in that time. The cross was like the electric chair, man. At the cross. The cross were, 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 was what criminals would get executed on. Publicly to send a message to everybody. Y'all don't be like him. It was to send a message. Y'all don't play with us. And anybody... Played with Rome, it was done. Rome was like, if you mess with us, this is what happened to you. Nobody comes off the cross. Nobody survives the cross. Nobody defeats the cross because nobody can defeat Rome. And now here comes Jesus. <laughs> Come on. Here comes Jesus who looks at the sign of death and sin and defeat and says, put me on it. Let me show y'all something. Put me on that cross. And watch what happens when you let God touch some Touch. Watch what happens. He will transform the cross to a sign of his power. The Greeks say, that's foolishness. But God took their best thing. The thing that God took what they thought would never work. And he used it. And so they was foolish. That why would a God so omnipresent so omnipotent will go on the cross because he said you know what I'm going to show y'all I can defeat this and the Bible says that he rose again he, he, he came off the cross <laughs> alright here we go let me keep going so the Greeks said foolishness they said how could a God wind up on the cross how can a God wind up on the cross it just didn't make sense to them they were still in a logically Logic mind thinking like this just don't make sense. To wind up on the cross made it look like, let me see, I'm going to talk to y'all. Nah, it made it look like Bernie Sanders. Good ideas but lose the vote. It, it make it look like Jim Jones, a religious leader 
who proved to be a fake. The best way to describe it, it made it look like Bernie Madoff. Someone who used people to get, someone to use people and got what he was coming. So, y'all go look him up. That would have been the impression of Jesus. So the Jews and the Greeks looked at the cross and said, foolishness. That's some foolishness. Scandal. And Paul said, yes, if you are perishing, it's foolishness. But if you are being saved, the message of the cross is the power of God. The message of the cross is the power of God. Just think about it. Think about the way how Jesus is. Just think about it. Jesus says, if you want to win, you got to surrender. That's foolishness. Jesus said, surrender and you will win. You got to look weak in order for you to win. They're like, what? That don't make sense. That's foolishness. Jesus says, if you want to get, you have to let go. They're like, that's foolishness. Jesus said, if you lose, you will gain. I'm like, what? That don't make sense foolishness by dying you will live by becoming by coming to the end you will find the beginning you go on a, you go to an empty tomb and then you get born again you're like what the ball they was like that's foolishness they said that's foolishness but it is the wisdom of god it's the wisdom of god it only seemed foolish because we just just little but the message of the cross and the world rejected it and that, that God could change that thing. Number two. Number two. Not only the message of the cross they say was foolishness. Why they say the gospel was foolishness. The message of the cross. But number two, the Bible also says the gospel is made available at no cost. They're like, what? No cost? That's foolishness. You mean all of that? Salvation is free? They're like, what y'all talking about? The reason the Greeks and the Jews rejected it is because it was free. Now the people, y'all got to understand this now. The people in that time, and when Paul wrote this letter, it was, it's not like the same time like right now. See, see, we live in a time that's different from that, that time. See, in Paul's time, there were principles and cultural norms that basically said you can't get something for nothing in those days. The only way you can get ahead is what's when you find someone that's ahead of you, and when they help you get ahead, you owe them something. In so many words, if you scratch my back, I'm going to scratch your back. That's how they operate. If I do for you, you do for me. If you want to get, if you want it to get, if you want to get it, you have to give. Paul lived in a time where nothing was easy, nothing was free. And the people were suspect of anything that was free. Jesus come preaching, free this, free salvation, eternal life, free. They're like, what? Scandal, stumbling block. What is he talking about? So Paul is telling them that Jesus has come. Jesus has died. Jesus has resurrected. He's coming again, and your life can be changed for free. They looked at him and they said, what? They looked at him the same way we do because the truth be told, we are suspects to things that's free too. Think about it. We've been fooled enough. We've been fooled enough to know that there's usually some fine print when you hear free. Come on, some of y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about. There's usually a string attached or something. Uh, there's usually some something somewhere to some free when you hear free. And, you know, somebody let's just say you want a free trip to the Bahamas, seven days free. Hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You, you look and you be like, hmm, that sound too good to be true. <laughs> right? That's just how we think. No, that's just not. Some, 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 some not right about that. That's just too good. <laughs> Seven days. You just want a free car. Minister Sam, come get your car. 
she, you get that? <laughs> well, first of all, you got to uh, make sure you a $1,000 deposit to call free, but you got to still put 5000 down on some other taxes. Free? Man, hold on. So, so anyway... And that's why salvation is foolish to those who's perishing, because it sounds too good to be true. Think about it. You trying to tell me that all my sins are washed away? You trying to tell me that God loves me unconditionally? You trying to prove to me that my reservation in heaven is secured and paid for? Free? You trying to tell me that I get another chance and another chance <laughs> And another chance, and another chance? What? Grace. You trying to tell me that when I call upon him, he answered me? You trying to tell me that no matter what stands against me, he's on my side? That sounds too good to be true, Jesus. That's foolishness. And it's free. Salvation is free. I can just see him. All you have to do is just say yes. If you say yes, you're a new creature. If you say yes, he will give you power. If you say yes, he will wash your sins away. If you say yes, he will send people in your life. If you say yes, all you have to do is say yes. It's very simple. But we have made it difficult. We have made it uh, 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 confusing. Because we choose not to believe. I don't know about you, but when I, when I grew up, and I was raised with an old slogan that say, if it's free, it's for me. Anybody know what I'm talking about? If it's free, it's for me. It's free. Man, mess around and go to uh, Hibbert Sports. And, and, I, and I'm going there to give me some shoes. And they say, buy one, get one. Free. Man, let me get two pairs, please. Size nine, yeah, them, them yellow J's and them black ones. Yeah, the, the black ones. Oh, yeah, if it's freeze for me, come on. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, 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 some of you, some of you who like flying Southwest, Southwest Airlines. Look, that's the only, that's the only planes we fly, Southwest. You know why? Because you get two free check bags. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Two free check bags, 50 pounds, the max. Oh, yeah, it's free. You get to bring it with you. Free. And, and, and that's why I like my uh, membership at Sam's. Some of y'all like, y'all got membership at Costco? Sometimes Costco too. Sometimes on your lunch break or whenever, you can walk around in the aisles. They got so many little demos and, and things. If you do it, if you play your cards right, you can have a whole meal for free. A little bit of this. What's this right here? Oh, okay. Next, uh, they got so many. You, you, you didn't eat lunch. Free. <laughs> Come on, man. Somebody say if it's free, it's for me. So if you like free shoes, if you like free check bags, if you like free food, can I offer you something else that's free? Salvation in the name of Jesus. If you just confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus rose from the dead, you will be saved. It's free. Forgiveness of sin, free. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, free. New life, free. Everlasting life, free. Abundant life, free. Somebody say, it's free. It's free, man. It's free. So they were like, this, is, this don't make sense. This don't make sense. So I'm going to go to my last point. See, I told y'all I'm not going to take y'all to take long. So what makes the gospel foolish? When they heard the message of the cross, they say foolishness. Also, it's available at no cost. It's free. But my last point, the gospel brings meaning to the loss. The gospel brings meaning to the loss. So I say, let me make it round. Message of the cross, available no cost, and meaning to the loss. It's your boy, passion. <laughs> Start wrapping up your...
If I rap my sermon, y'all y'all jam while y'all receiving it? Jesus. All right. Uh, last point. But they also, they also said, this is foolishness. Here's what made the gospel foolish to those who were perishing. But to those who heard it, they got, they were, for those who was being saved, they didn't look at it as foolish. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Put it on the screen just so they can see it. They looked at, this is why they said it was foolish. Because look, they looked at the resumes of those who were Christian. And they realized that Christianity was not just for the rich. Christianity was not just for those who were gifted. Christianity was not just for those who were powerful, who had, was an authority. Christianity was not just for those who was upper class, middle class. But it was also for the broke people. It was also for the sinners. It was also for the publicans. It was also for the tax collectors. It was also for the lepers and for the prostitutes and for women and for uneducated, sick, blind, lame, for all those. It was for all of them. And so they was like, what? How in the world they come? They uneducated. They don't know. They don't know. Tax collectors. And they robbed me. Oh, no. They were looking at it like this is foolishness. We, we, we do better than them. We know more than them. We smarter than them. And so, and so they say that's some foolishness. That God would choose them. And the core of our, can I tell y'all, the core of our faith is we are a faith that reaches out to those who struggle. That should be the core of our faith, to reach out to those who struggle and not to be like. Because in church today, it's, 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 people pass up on people like that. They look at them like, oh, you know what I'm saying? Something wrong with them. That's what church is supposed to be. But you know what we do? We, we, we think church is a museum. Where, where we come and look at the best and, and we come and look at the perfect and, and sit down and observe things. We look at it as a museum. Just the best worship, just the best. But church is not a museum. Church is a rehab clinic. We said hospital, but I think it's a rehab clinic. Because at the end of the day, we all in here want God to do something. Right? It's a rehab clinic because everybody in here is being delivered from something. Real talk. Your something may not be his something or her something, or it might not be my something, but I know it's something. <laughs> You can smile and that church all you want, but we all fighting with something. That's why we here tonight. Not for no show. We want a word. That's going to change us. And so everybody in here struggling with a little something. Don't look at your neighbor. Stop looking at your neighbor. <laughs> y'all wrong for that. Looking at the person they can tell you. So let me share a story. There was a man that went out to eat on a Friday night, you know, and he, he was struggled. He, he had a little health issue. He was going to eat out with his sister and family and stuff like that. And so he always struggled with, like, acid reflux, acid reflux. And so he went around and eat something that he knew he should have not eaten, some prime rib. He said, I knew I should have not eaten it. So that thing then got stuck in his throat to where it just wasn't going down. So his sister brought him to the hospital. So they got there in the emergency room. He's packing the emergency room. They said, nah. Now, you don't know, if anybody know about the emergency room, you ain't going back there unless you're bleeding, unless you got a baby on the way, or you're catching a heart attack. You, you, where, where we go? In the waiting room, right? And so that was this, this drunk that walked in. He was a little drunk and toxic. He was clearly understood that he, something was wrong with him. He walked in there. He go sit down. By this lady. He sat down by this lady. Now, this man, he was talkative. He talked, talked, talked. You could have tell he, something was just not right. He was just talking, talking to everybody. He sat down. So he sat down by a lady. He started looking at that lady. The lady was dressed in, look, I'm talking about, look, a, a mint coat. Like, I'm talking about, look, 
fur jacket. She had Gucci shoes, Gucci purse. You know what I'm saying? She, she was, look, chin was up, nose was up. So he talking to her. He said, hey, what's out? You know, he drunk. You know what I'm saying? He talking to her, you know. So she look at him like, so she move over to the next chair. And so he say, oh, okay. So he got up and moved to the next chair next to her. You know what I'm saying? And so, uh, so she looking at him like she just way better than him. And he say, ma'am, look, let me tell you something. You're looking at me crazy. But the truth of the matter is, we all waiting on the doctor. <laughs> so I don't know about you, <laughs> but that somebody looking at your fur jacket or, or, or you might be looking. We all waiting on the doctor. We all waiting on, on, on the doctor to see us, right? We all waiting on the doctor and everybody in here is waiting on the Lord to do something, waiting on the Lord to heal. Waiting on the law to deliver, waiting on the law to answer, waiting on the law to make a way. We all waiting on the law to do something in our life. And what Paul is saying is, you can't judge a life by what it's going through. You have to judge a life by what God was willing to pay for it. You have to judge a life by what God did. On Calvary for it, not by his appearance. God loves everybody. And the church were treating people different, looking over people. You know, God looks at us all in a unique way. He loves us all in a unique way. Some of us say we love us all the same, but I believe he loves us all in a unique way. It's even more special because he loves everybody. In a special way. He loved all of us. Full to the max. But it's in a special way. So we can't look at a life because of the condition they're in. The struggle they're in. And, and look at them with our nose up. Because at the end of the day. To be honest with you. Some of you been in that same situation. So. The value of your life is not what people read on your resume. The value of your life is the price that God was willing to pay for you and me. Christ was the price that God was willing to pay for. Amen. Musicians, y'all can come up. I'm going to share another story with y'all. This is a true story right here. It's my life. So... I'll let y'all know about it. So in April, y'all remember when the pandemic happened? They started shutting things down like in March or something like that. Because I remember we was about to have the worship night over here. <laughs> I think like March 20th. Pastor gave us a call the week before we shut down. I said, oh, Pastor, let's just wait one more week. He said, no, we got to shut down. I said, all right. So we went home. You know, we was chilling. We, we was all home chilling. And so I'm like, we all in a place where we don't know what's going on. It's a lockdown all around the world. So maybe a few weeks later, we chilling in the house. I'm like, it's hot in here. Come to find out the air conditioner broke. You remember that? I say, oh, this is not the right time for no air conditioner to break. Nobody working. <laughs> Nobody coming out. I say, this is not right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so it was like in April, air conditioner broke down. And so I'm like, man, what are we going to do? And so it wasn't a money issue. It was just like, who going to come fix it? So I said, I know somebody, Mr. Thompson, Miss Lynn Husband. I said, what's up, Mr. Thompson? What's going on, my brother? He a Christian man. I said, man, I got an issue, man. Our air conditioner went out, man. He said, man, so what, what, what is it doing? I said, it ain't coming on. <laughs> it's hot, you know what I'm saying? I said, man, can you come check it out, man? Please, bro, I, 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 you know, whatever we got to pay, whatever, you know. And it was nighttime, like 8, 9 o'clock at night. We, I said, I was already talking to my wife. I said, babe, we just got to, we have to put the fans on or something. You know, I, I know how to sleep in hot. I, I, 
I know how to make it. You know what I'm saying? I have my car air conditioned with no air, but my babies do. I say, oh, no, they got something. <laughs> so, so, all right, he came over. I say, praise God. So he looked at the air conditioning and he, he, he checked it out. I went in the house. I was praying. I said, Lord, I pray that it's not nothing that bad. <laughs> so he said, all right, Minister Brian. So, well, find out the issue, man. I think he said the, the uh, compressor went out. And I was like, oh, Lord. I know when I hear compressor. That's why my call back then, then I couldn't fix my AC to the compressor when I, I say, well, they say three, four hundred dollars. I'm like 18. I'm like, damn. So anyway. So he said the compressor went out. And so I'm like, what? So you know me, being the person I am, I like to ask questions. You know what I'm saying? The debate, I just want to figure out what, what, what can we do? So I'm like, so what's the problem with it? He said the compressor went out. So I asked him, how much would it cost? He told me, a lot. <laughs> uh, he told me it would be cheaper for you to buy a new AC unit. I said, okay, why? He said, okay, well, this is what he tell me. Because when you're going to repair something, you have to determine whether uh, uh, you should repair it or replace it. He said, you have to think about these three things. How much did it cost you in the first place? How often does it break down? If it's old or if it's, you know what I'm saying? And we, we bought the house years ago and... I think it's, a, it's an older air conditioner. And he, the third question, he says, what's the cost of repairing it? He said, you got to figure out the cost of repairing it. So you already told me the cost of repairing it is going to be almost close to a new air conditioner. And so he says, if, if, if it didn't really cost much in the beginning, and if it keep on breaking, and if the cost of repairing it is too much, you might as well replace it. I'm going to say it again. If it wasn't worth much in the beginning with, and if all it does is keep breaking down, and if the cost of repairing it is more than the cost of replacing it, just go ahead and get rid of it and get you another one, something else. Some of y'all still think I'm talking about the AC unit. Let me, let me say it again. But I'm talking about us. We ought to rejoice whenever we think about God saving. Because look, check this out. Because we wasn't much to begin with. Come on. <clears throat> the Bible says we were shaping dust. We were made in dirt. Forming iniquity. Born in sin. Number two. We let God down every day. We keep breaking down. Come on. Time after time. Time after time. Time after time. And number three, the cost of saving you was the death of Jesus Christ. The cost to redeem you is much more than you really worth. And because, you, because he died for me, I'm going to live for him. And this is, and even, even if I have to look like a fool to the world, I'm just going to act a fool for Christ. I'm just going to act a fool. <laughs> Is anybody in here say, I'm going to live for God tonight? I'm going to strive for God. He's done too much for me. Yes. And that's what God showed me. Even though this is what God used to save the world, the foolishness of preaching, the foolishness of the gospel, let us not look at it as foolishness but let's look at it as wisdom and even though the world might persecute you or laugh at you because of your faith we know what God has done for us and we believe and trust in his word because it doesn't matter how worldly how smart a person is or how educated a person is <clears throat> that's that's human wisdom that's worldly wisdom that's perish but the word of God will stand forever. And so I just want to pray with you tonight. I want to pray with you tonight. If this word spoke with you, spoke to you tonight and it kind of sparked something in your heart to say, you know what? You're right. I've been all over my Bible, but I kind of lost focus on the gospel. I lost focus on what saved my soul. 
And I got so caught up on more on building uh, 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 other good things that might be good, more on uh, striving for in my business or striving to uh, craft my gifts, which is all great things. But if we have a lose focus of what's most important, then we lose focus on the understanding. And, and, and you won't understand scriptures in, in the Bible like we're supposed to. And so I'm going to pray tonight and we go get out of here. For the Bible says it may seem foolish to those who are perishing, but it's the power of God to those being saved. For God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God, we just thank you tonight for your word. Thank you for speaking to our hearts and showing us, Lord God, what you've done, reminding us of the things you've done on Calvary to save our souls. God, we put our faith and trust in you tonight. God, we just thank you, Lord God, that your wisdom, you are wiser than worldly wisdom. God, we just trust in you, God, no matter if sometimes we just might not understand or if you said it, Lord God, we believe it. And we trust it in you tonight, God. So we just thank you for speaking to our hearts, for showing us and reminding us all the things that you have done for us. All the things that you, you did so that we can have life. All the things you've done so that we can have salvation for free. God, we want to seek you. We want to do your will. No matter what it takes, God, no matter if the world reject us or no matter what they do, clown us or whatever it might be, God, our hope and our trust is in you. Our joy doesn't come from this world, but it comes from you, God. We just pray that you would truly, Lord God, draw us closer to you, to your gospel, to your word, to the cross for your glory, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give God some glory tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I got a little time to pray the sinner's prayer for those who, who want to accept Christ. Maybe you heard this message and you was like, you know what? I was one of those. I, 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 I was one of those who thought the gospel was foolishness. I thought it was just, you know, and my life has been really perishing. I really, you know, well, the Bible says, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. If you want to have everlasting life tonight, and you believe in the works of Christ, and you believe in the cross, you believe in the message of the cross, then you have an opportunity to give your life to him tonight. It's very simple. All you have to do is admit. Just look at yourself and say, you know what? Look at your life. Be like, you know, Lord, I, I fall short. I messed up. I made bad decisions. I hurt people's lives. I put myself in the wrong place. I could have been. God, I admit I'm not perfect. I've made a lot of mistakes, God. Once you have realized that you're not perfect, you admit that. You say, I can't do it without you. Then you come down to believe. You say, Lord, I, I know I can't do it, but I know you can do it. I believe in what you've done on the cross. I believe in your sacrifice. I believe you love me unconditionally. I believe you have a purpose for my life. I believe you have called me for such a time as this. I believe there is more. There is greater. I've been living life in circles. Chasing all the wrong things when I should be chasing you. God, I believe in you. I put my faith in you. I put my weight in you. I lean to you, God. I believe in everything your word says. And see, now that you believe, the Bible tells us not to be ashamed of the gospel. Now we confess that he is our Lord. We're not ashamed to confess. We confess. We tell others that he's my Lord. We testify what the Lord has done for us. We share to others that God has been awesome. He changed my heart. He changed my life. 
And when you do these things, you confess in the gospel and you confess your testimony, the Bible says we shall be saved. You have an opportunity to be saved. All you got to do is repeat it. Say, Most High God, here I am, just the way I am, calling upon you today. You said that he so ever, whosoever, I'm sorry, call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm calling upon you tonight to save my soul, to lead me to the cross, lead me to the gospel, give me direction, show me my purpose. God, I do believe in the word, and I do believe in the gospel that you died for my sins, that you shed your blood for my sins, and you rose again on the third day, and you're coming back. I believe it all, God. Help me to trust you more. To put my faith in you more. No matter what's going on around me, I would trust in you. With all my heart, all my mind, and all my soul. Thank you, Lord, for redeeming me by your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Give God some glory. Thank you all so much. For hearing the word, I believe it was a word. I, I believe it spoke to your heart and it challenged you to, to really examine our hearts and really push forward and see God so we can go out there and be the light and salt to the world. Let me pray the benediction over you. Pray that the Lord would bless you, that he would keep you, that he would shine his face upon you, that he would be gracious upon you, that he would reward you, that he would continue to protect you, to give you guidance, to give you strength. God, I just pray to our God that you will continue to make every person in here uh, uh, to be salt and light to this world, Lord God. You have called us, and I just pray that you would truly uh, keep us focused, God, on the things that's most important, and that's the gospel, that's the word. God, we just pray that you give us traveling grace to our homes, bless us as we hit the road and as we uh, go to sleep in our peaceful homes. We just pray that you would keep us overnight and just just have your way in our lives God we just thank you for all what you're doing in our life thank you for our pastor bless him keep him as well and his family God we just thank you for such an awesome time in your presence tonight God thank you for speaking to our hearts and we say these things in Jesus name amen thank y'all love y'all see y'all Sunday lost back